to kind of bring that into a little bit the, the idea of those you know rich kids in connecticut listening to music that's ostensibly about some yeah. poor inner city uh guy in his life who probably you know, isn't yeah. poor and probably isn't right exactly they all inner city cool too but right but but let's just ignore that for a minute but, but the, the point is the yeah the point is both of those archetypes are essentially perversions of two natural states. The one is the state of having enoughness, of plenty, of comfortability in, 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 in uh, your physical existence, which doesn't mean that you've got the amount of money that a Rolls Royce dealer's son would have at his disposal. It means you have enough to sustain you for now. I mean, that's, that's as rich as humans need to be, is enough to have enough for now. And then the opposite, and and so so the idea of the you know Connecticut richster that's got way more than he could ever use is a perversion of that idealized enoughness to the point where it's so excessive as to really be a perversion of just having you've got so much that you but nothing's substantial because it's not a natural state of having enough. It's more than it's it's bigger. It's it's non-natural amount of stuff that they they have the opposite of that is the idea that you're so poor that you have to fight and kill and steal for everything and 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 that very tribal uh, um territorial maybe more than tribal uh existence to the point where you have to work really hard scrounge really hard fight for everything just to have barely enough Welcome once again to Make Art Not Friends. Today on episode 10 of the podcast, we have a lot to cover, so we're breaking the discussion into two parts to make it more digestible, or at least we hope it will be. In part one, we will dive into hero archetypes and the dangers of mistaking the celebrity persona for a real person, as well as degeneration or degradations in the general quality and conceptualization of art over the past century or so. We hope you will enjoy this discussion, and thank you as always for listening. Yeah, so I, I think I was reading an article on, I think it was an article on SOTT.net. Anyway, I don't recall, but it was like a comment thread. And um, yeah, someone was comment, like some musical artist or someone died or did something, you know, some, some crazy extravagant thing, like the usual. And um, they said something along the lines of like, yeah, you know, they, they're, they were saying they always look for people that are like the just the tip top epitome of like self-absorbed like hubris like mm. just like it's kind of like extravagant excess like mm-hmm. some sometimes often borderline sociopathic like very like and and so when i wrote down the topic of like the artist in society like who who is the artist like what types of people and now i would even say like i'm mainly talking about musical artists because Mm -hmm. that's like you know in this digital age that's it's just easier to to hit people with that you know and so i think this will actually dovetail really nicely with the sort of larger conversation that i see coalescing um on this podcast um and in my mind of like how music and music culture are being used to degenerate and shape our culture. And so anyway, so, so essentially what they were saying was that uh, rather than in, in most cases, rather than, you know, fame and fortune causing people to become a certain way, i.e., you know, uh, I don't know, greedy, self-absorbed, sort of just generally kind of like soulless and demonic, maybe. Um, no judgment, just an observation. Um, mm-hmm. and, the, and, and, you know, and like the more popular, the more rich, the more famous you get, the more that way you will become because you are, you know, influenced by the industry, 
the the right the cult the culture the music industry culture the people within that culture um that's sort of one perspective um another perspective is that's the, the you know the people with those personality traits are selected specifically for the purpose of being placed at those high levels and the more they sort of um the the better i should say they mat they are a match to this inventory of this like almost like sort of kind of sociopathic myers briggs type of situation Mm -hmm. you know like i I, not and i shouldn't i shouldn't harp on that it's not necessarily you know sociopathic it's just sort of i would say narcissistic um at the very least like sort of like self-focused and uh anyway what i wanted to connect this to is that um you know max egan right yes so i was watching one of his videos you know i'm all about you know i'm really into like gematria and stuff like that or to whatever extent you know someone who you know isn't like a 33rd degree whatever can be into stuff like that because i feel like what do we really know at the end of the day but um and he was he was saying that you know they know the, the reason that they encode all of this geometry and stuff into like words and texts and like architecture and, you know, like DC. And he was saying the reason that they put all of that stuff is because they know that intelligent people like us exist who want to research and will research it. And they put it there in order to distract us from what's going on in our own lives. Mm Mm-hmm. Because, because the most dangerous thing to them actually would be if we just um, looked at, ev- everyone looked at their own individual life and applied the principles of natural law to their own individual life, like boots on the ground, one step at a time. And you know, not glossing over anything. And so, um, you know, if you get sort of the most astute people of the bunch who, of course, are going to be, you know, the, the, the researchers um, in some capacity, and you kind of like suck them into this rabbit hole of symbolism and, you know, ancient stuff that is fascinating, but ultimately doesn't really have much of a bearing or an effect on their own life, then um you'll you'll sort of be able to s- strangle any efforts they have of, of kind of like changing but anyway I, I digress what i wanted to say is i feel like at the center of this strategy is um because so this this actually applies to this applies to both artists and to um, like fic- the fictional characters created by artists. So and then and it, actually the, there's a connector here because for example a lot of these like Beyonce right they have alter egos, mm-hmm. uh, especially these musical artists. And so I would say that the the artist persona that could be like this is like a trinity artist persona, um, alter ego slash secret identity. And, you know, heroes, anti-heroes of, of fiction and, and folklore. What do they all have in common, right? From our vantage point, what do they all have in common? What makes them different from, you know, you and me and Joe Schmo down at the, the corner store deli? We have a limited number of people we can influence you know whatever maybe some people listen to our podcast great you know what i mean whatever or, you know mm-hmm. like i go i go to a I don't know, frat party whatever you know what i mean just, and we we can you know i can i can hold a, a room i can talk to a room people listen to me but i'm not going to get on tv and talk to thousands of people i'm not going to go to madison square right. garden and like play a sold out show to a bunch of you know vaccinated boosted you know tweeny boppers or whatever but um, 
And so that's the difference is they are all larger than the light. Mm -hmm. And so when we see them, when we regard them, it's like when you open a book and in fact, a character in a book would be in this same sort of echelon, right? You, it's like the, the larger than life imaginal realm where, you know, we, we like, let me put it to you this way. When, when you encounter something in your everyday life, or when I encounter something in my everyday life, I, um, I pass judgment on it. You know, I think everyone does. And people that say that don't are lying because everybody does. Uh, and if you know how not to, and you know how to stop, let me know. Um, like literally I'll give you my email because I feel like I'd be really cool to know how to stop having that running commentary and passing judgment on everything all the time. Um, I haven't figured out how to do it. And I would wager that most people have not figured out how to do it in their everyday life. That's the caveat. However, when you are consuming a work of fiction, you're not passing judgment. You're not because you're there because not in the moment, maybe later, if you have to write an essay or you're reflecting on it, but in the moment, I would say nine times out of 10, you're caught up in the story. Things are moving like pretty fast, you know, especially if it's like a, a page turner or a movie or whatever, or, or at the very least, most people are not aware enough when they're engaging with these forms of media or art they're not at a sufficiently um, stable, individuated level of consciousness to be actually analyzing, uh, you know, what, what is the, how is this person behaving? Are they behaving in a moral capacity? Would I encourage this type of behavior in real life? Would I call them out if I saw? And especially if you think of something like the Marvel movies, right? It's set up in a way where everything that's happening is happening in a context that is just so radically different from everyday life that it's almost designed to short circuit that like, well, wait a second. Oh, that, that wasn't very nice. Or like, huh, wonder how he got away with that. Or, oh, yeah, I can't believe you just said that to her. And so this makes it the perfect um, tool for gradually, 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 gradually conditioning people's behavior and modifying people's behavior. Because it, I, I, my, my sort of like hypothesis, thesis thing that I'm positing is that when you are a child, right, you kind of live in that imaginal realm right? Everything is, everything is larger than life to you, you know, stuff happens, you just sort of absorb it. And they've proven that children are, they've shown their brainwave activity is different. They're more in the trance suggestion. That's why they learn so rapidly. You know, you can, I, if I get someone and I have done this into a hypnotic trance, you know, you can you have them learn just as quickly. All you have to do is just shut down all of that, that analyzing, assessing um, function of, of, the conscious part of the mind that, that basically is constantly cross-referencing things and, you know, kind of going back to the database and, and saying, oh, well, hold on, let's see, oh, this is happening. Oh, well, what about, you know, let me, let me, let me consult physics. Like, is that even possible? Hmm. Captain America's shield is, you know, indestructible. Is that even possible? But when you're, when you're, you know, when you're a child and when you're watching a Marvel movie or when you're listening to pop music, there's something that is happening that is like you're having like a, like a mystical experience because it's, it's just, it doesn't leave the room or the time or you don't have the desire or some combination of those things to apply what you know about the rules of the world. And so this is kind of, and this really came together as I was saying all this, but, but I really, I'm glad I was able to sort of articulate it. I think the goal is to essentially erode knowledge and erode morality on a fundamental level and bring us back to a sort of childlike state where we will just sort of, where people are very easily programmed and they'll kind of, you know, like they'll just, they're, they're led 
by by idolizing and identifying with these sort of these characters. And again, it's it's very tricky because they're not all fictional. Some of them are real. Some of them are real musicians. Like a lot of these rap, you know, stars that are like, you know, like you know, man, they're living hard and fast. Like you know, we on the street, we on the block. Like we selling Molly. Like you know, all that stuff. Like that cultural that trope. Like at at a certain point, when you have inundated someone with examples of that and and everyone around them maybe is like pretty normal and doesn't do that stuff but all of these larger than life characters that like have gold teeth and like lots of money and like they're at the club they're surrounded by beautiful women it starts to you know affect just the same way that like you know you could you could do that to children if you just if you show children a bunch of examples of people that like have it all they're gonna be like oh wait a second well i'm gonna do what they do you know i want i want you know i want to be you know badass and popular and rich and have beautiful women following me so um i don't know i just wanted to float that idea i think that that would be a really cool conversation because it's the best way to conduct warfare you just you you just you you know it's like consistency is key you just wear people down and eventually you have their mind and then regardless of what else is going on, regardless of, of the knowledge they have and what they know, once you've gotten into their head, it's kind of like you've pretty much won, you know, you've pretty much won that, that battle. And when you say gotten into their head, what, you know, and correct me if I'm not hearing you right, but in an attempt to clarify, It's not necessarily so much that, I mean, it is that you've gotten to their head, but how so or in what way, I guess. And it seems to well, me like it's gotten into your head. Basically, the, the, some sort of pipeline has been opened to get around that critical thinking filter. Like, basically, let me give you an example, okay? Let me, because I'm, um, I don't care about being politically correct like if there's a good example i'll just so like for example i was at this one place in connecticut and i might have told you about this um that was full of like really like obnoxiously wealthy white like um new yeah England. i've heard of that like, place it's called uh connecticut yeah right yeah well yeah i mean to spoiler alert so anyway yeah i was in a place in a place in connecticut and uh, it was just, it was, it was that whole scene, like, you know, boat shoes and mm -hmm. po polos and mm -hmm. like, I mean, like it was as far as the eye could see. And, um, and all these, these guys, all these kids were, were like, you know, their dad was like the senator, you know, like li literally, mm -hmm. like, you know, their daddy, you know, owned the, the, the Rolls Royce dealership in like Greenwich, Connecticut, whatever it was, you know, or like worked in, was, owned an insurance firm in Stanford, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Right. And so they're all from that world. Like they all went to some prep school or whatever, you know what I mean? They, 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 they lived that life. And yet, when we would get in the car, they would all put on the most like mind blowingly thuggish trap music you've ever heard in your life. Like, like, like just demonstratively, like it, it was, it was like nails on a chalkboard, not just the music, but that they were listening to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so the reason I choose this example is that, they like they just i feel like they found themselves inadvertently worshiping these musical artists and the lifestyle that they were leading and they were they were literally like they were literally being hypnotized like i mean just just think about that i i i, I don't know that there's a better example than that you have these these people like they have everything, they have it all. They literally went to prep school. Like the, you know, if they ever like you know fell and you know were about to twist their ankle, like literally a mattress made of money would just like 
you know what I mean? Like a, like a mm-hmm. vacuum robot would just like cushion their fall. And poof, like they're just like, they're set. And yet they're listening to like young thug and like, they're really into it. They're really passionate. And I think that's just a really good example because this like this, this degeneration of society is like a really calculated really engineered thing there's like a lot of money and time and effort and resources and think tanks invested in it and i just i just think that would be a good conversation to have today because people really don't realize like yeah like you know when you listen to pop music and shit like every single you know it's like as far as i'm concerned it's like the guy in clockwork orange when they tape his eyes open you know like that's we're all in that position. We just don't, to varying degrees, we may not know it, but it's like, you know, when they're trying to program you, everything in that programming that they show the guy whose eyes are taped open is like pretty well thought out. You know, it's, it's not just, you know what I'm getting at? Like, like I do, I do. The possible exception of like Ed Sheeran, you know, I don't believe that a lot of this stuff is like, oh, you know, this girl broke up with me and I wrote a song. Like, no, like it's like, the music and the sounds and the, the persona and the, the character of the musician and like everything is like very much thought out in order to, you know. Yeah. That's too big. It's too big of a business. And, There's too much money at stake to take chances on. Uh, entertainers image, public persona. I mean, that there's too much at stake to let the, let the let the uh, entertainer decide how they want to be in the daily world you know everything has to be crafted again there's just too much money at stake right but yeah so um yeah and like for example somewhere i i can't remember where i somewhere i saw it um written it was an article i was reading they were saying that they were analyzing the language used in in ancient greece and they found that prior to the rise of like athens and what we sort of traditionally associate with maybe you said this to me no and democracy um they the 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 language that they used was not centered it it didn't really contain the concept of the i or the individuated ego like at all they didn't refer to themselves or anyone in those terms everything was sort of they 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 they're the it was more of a mythic vernacular. They very frequently referenced, you know, the gods and, you know, the, the, the Greek heroes and like the Trojan war. And basically like it it was shown that like. The cultural discourse revolved around these like archetypes of the heroes and the gods who were that was like their movie stars. That was like their, you know, their, their, their lack of a better description. That was like their big, like hip hop or pop star who like they, they were, those were guides to behavior. So it was just a different model. Like just the, you know, like in, in whatever, in Judaism or in, in Catholicism, you have, you know, you have a literal rule book, like a literal book of rules, like do this, don't do this as a guide to behavior it's very literal it's very rigid whereas in the greek system it was more like loose like hey check out this story this like you like you always say this guy acted like this look what happened to him you know this guy acted like this look what happened to him he was full of hubris you know the gods like turned him into a you know fucking i don't know chamber pot or whatever whatever (laughs) happens you know um i just think it's really interesting because now what our what are our cultural myths in america it's just a vacuum we don't actually have any real cultural myths that are passed down from generation to generation we have new ones being churned out very rapidly 
And that's why, you know, if you go to like trivia or like some kind of a pop culture trivia game, like if you're even a little bit removed from stuff that happened in one decade, you don't know shit. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's, it's just being produced and reproduced so rapidly. So I just think, I, I think that's where I want to kind of zero in on is like, what do we have to look at as a society, as a culture? Like who are our examples to look up to of how to act? Cause it's not Zeus, you know, it's not Heracles, you know, is it young thug? Like, cause if it is, then like, we shouldn't be surprised as to the way things are going, you know, and, like and the, there's yeah. always, you know, there's always the, that sense of, of, you know, thinking of I in this individuated consciousness um, as more a, a composite of mythic archetypes, so to speak, you know, Zeus and whomever. Um, you're right, and a lot of that is explored by, uh, or was explored by the psychologist Julian Jaynes. His book, uh, Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, talks about how language used to do that thing and now the language we use you know the, the idea of the bicameral mind being there was an inus but really it was this these archetypes that were painted as or, or talked about as as external characters but that wasn't really the nobody took that literally at the time Rather, they had the sense that there was the I in the mind, but then there was also the other in the mind. And those were the, you know, kind of that dialogue that you have today, that kind of the internal dialogue was the other talking to the I-ness. And they spoke about the other as a different entity archetypally. Mm. And that's where the bicameral mind is. There's two, two chambers. And one is the inus, and one is the idealized, uh, um, whether it's love, whether it's hate, all the idealized conditions of human wow. consciousness. So that book's really good for going into what you're talking about. But to kind of bring that into a little bit, the, the idea of those, you know, rich kids in Connecticut listening to music that's ostensibly about some yes. poor inner city uh, guy and his life who Selling probably you know, isn't apparently. poor and probably isn't. Right, exactly. In they the all went to city. school too, but right, but but let's just ignore that for a minute. But, that's but the point is supposed to appeal to, yeah. The point is both of those archetypes are essentially perversions of two natural states. The one is the state of having enoughness, of plenty, of comfortability right. in in in, in uh, your physical existence. Which doesn't mean that you've got the amount of money that a Rolls Royce dealer's son would have at his disposal. It means you have enough to sustain you for now. I mean, that's that's as rich as humans need to be is enough to have enough for now. And then the opposite, and and so so the idea of the you know Connecticut richster that's got way more than he could ever use is a perversion of that idealized enoughness. To the point where it's so excessive as to really be a perversion of just having you've got so much that you but nothing's substantial because it's not a natural state of having enough it's more than it's a bit bigger it's it's non-natural amount of stuff that they they have the opposite of that is the idea that you're so poor that you have to fight and kill and steal for everything and 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 that very tribal uh, um, territorial maybe more than tribal uh, right. existence right. to the point where you have to work really hard, scrounge really hard, fight for everything just to have barely enough. Both of those states exist, but the rich kid and the thug rapper are perversions of those states that are then repackaged and sold back to us. I mean, that's, again, what the the alchemy of evil is all about taking something natural right away from the individual mutating it and selling it back to them and so you've got these kids that are so rich that they have no idea what poverty's like but that's not natural so they're drawn to the opposite 
exactly and the opposite is so exactly. far removed that there's never a balance that it's this big swing between these two extremes rather than finding you know the natural thing is to be at points in your life where you have enough and points in your life where you're struggling to have enough that's kind of the natural ebb and flow you know you might have three or four very successful crop seasons in a row and then one where it's a drought and you really have to struggle you know that's the that's the nature of of life of life in the world at least as it is as we know it now um so yeah it's interesting because i think that those rich kids are trying to get to some semblance of of that you know balance but the only options available to them are so wildly extreme that if they come into balance it's that very quick moment when they're swinging between rapidly between extremes right. so it just crosses but it keeps well and i think i think that because they have essentially only known such exorbitant wealth and comfort that in order to balance the 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 degree of that that they have sort of like seen and experienced that has really made up most of their experience they seek out like the most extreme the opposite polarity which is like extreme instability extreme violence extreme chaos because but it's but you know it's really interesting too because when you look at like wait and you're like right there you're in seattle so if you look at like portland and this whole you know foaming at the mouth social justice warrior phenomenon it's like 95 percent suburban middle-aged white i mean the middle class upper middle class white kids that have literally never i mean like you know the worst thing that ever happened to them was they got a c on their fucking algebra final you know what I mean? And so and so it makes sense that they, like you're saying, they gravitate towards a real life manifestation or a real life experience, even if it's someone else's experience of struggle and of adversity and of like, because it's not, I mean, you know, it, it's, I don't think anyone in their right mind would say, no, you know, no one is oppressed. No one has ever been oppressed. You know, no one has ever been judged for the color of this. Yeah, obviously, you know, it's it's plain to see to anybody that that is and has taken place um but to you know to hyper focus on it and fall into that world sort of is indicative of like a thirst for for adversity is a thirst for you know seeing the world from that angle right like the haves and the have nots, like what, you know what I mean? Cause it, and honestly, a lot of, a lot of black people that I know, in fact, I was just talking to a couple of them, you know, the other day, you know, they're just like, yeah, it's, you know, like, this is the world, like move on. Like why, you know what I mean? Why are you going to get sucked into like a, a zombified movement, like black lives matter over, it? you know what I mean? Like you just, just, just because the thing that this movement says it exists to fight exists in the world doesn't mean you should like sign up for the first you know corporate sponsored nonsense that that you know the wind blows your way mm -hmm. um and and so it's just anyway i just think that's another illustration of the same point that the people who are who do jump on that bandwagon are the ones that are essentially they're the most desperate to like get their fix of like oh my pendulum has been it's just only swung this way and I'm like stuck over here. So I need to, I need to like over identify with some, you know, alleged adversity that someone else is going through in order to balance it out. I just need to feel something. I need to, you know, I need to dive into the plight of the have nots mm -hmm. in order to reach that center point of, you know, Nirvana or whatever. Um, anyway. Yeah. And, you know, something that always, struck me especially when all the blm stuff was going on now 2020 uh and the i don't know if you heard of the shop seattle autonomous zone that they set up quote unquote during that summer but you know having gone down there a couple of times when it was going and you know been sitting on a bus when a big end immigration and and blm kind of march was happening and they walked right. I mean, the bus literally had to stop in the middle of the street while these people walked past us. But you know, look out the window, and it is, I can attest, 90% or thereabouts 
white kids between the ages of say 16 and 25 uh, and knowing Seattle, this is a pretty well-to-do area. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even even the tougher spots, tougher neighborhoods, quote unquote. It's not Detroit. It's not DC. It's not right. you know to say nothing of Mumbai or Calcutta or right. Tehran or whatever, um, or Canada. like Mexico City for crying out loud, Austin, right? Um, or like Rio. Yeah. It, it just, yeah. <laughs> There's not <laughs> entire communities who live their entire lives in a dump, literally just picking through garbage for their entire life. I mean, that that's, I can't remember the name of the documentary, but a couple of five years ago, it was a documentary about the people that live in this huge landfill in outside of Rio. And all they do is pick through the trash and find stuff they can sell. And they literally live and build their houses in and out of, uh that anyway so you know it's not that seattle's pretty well to do so these 18 to 20 year old or 16 to probably 25 year old is a better range you know they don't really know what they think they know about poverty not that i'm not that i necessarily have firsthand experience with that level of poverty either but here's what always strikes me about them you're in it here to help the poor and help the oppressed and help the downtrodden. First of all, who is it specifically that you're trying to help? Because you can try to help some idealized nebulous group, but exactly. if that group doesn't really exist or if it's just your idea of some, you know, theoretical. Well, you don't know who that group is because you're chasing the the algorithms like little exactly. stick that makes you and or or all your friends or you and all your friends think that you're a good person because right. you have all of the the 16 items of flair, you know, you've got the Mm -hmm. rainbow and the BLM fist and whatever else. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, even if you could, you know, assuming for a second that there is a real group, that there are real people at the end of your, your um, social justice rabbit hole, social justice tunnel, that there's actual physical people, flesh and blood people at the end of that. Do they even want your help? Have you asked them? You know, if you're all, we're here to help the oppressed, did you even ask the oppressed if they want your help? Did you ask the poor if they want your help? Yeah. I mean, it, it, first of all, who are they? Tell me, point to who you're trying to help. And second of all, tell me that they said, yes, please help me. Because otherwise, you're wasting everybody's time. If you're right. trying to help somebody that doesn't want your help, is it going to use your help? Well, and that's the thing. I doing? mean, I think it's, it's, it's plain as day to anyone with, who's who's really looking that they are the the like textbook example of like the useful idiot phenomenon yeah. because the whole the whole impetus for all of this was literally generated on their Instagram feed you know what i mean like the, these these kids did not and g- did not give a fuck and would not give a fuck about any of this stuff if it hadn't started popping up and you know it just it's it's just social engineering at its finest and so like at that point yeah i mean this is it's it's kind of interesting it's just the newest version though because again not to always relate everything back to christianity but that was the drive for you know alan watts talks a lot about this too you just reminded me of that because he essentially he was like he was saying you know like the 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 christian the judeo-christian west has been quote unquote improving the world has been on a quest to improve the world for, you know, a few centuries now. He's like, and we've just, like, we've wrecked everything. <laughs> but it's just all that does is create this, and it doesn't even create sameness. It just creates a frantic desire for and uh, obsession with, sameness and then you have the phenomenon in like you know india and all of these like countries uh where all of the people are like frantically lightening their skin do you know about this whole thing uh in in haiti and in india and it's like this whole thing where like and and like all the movie stars and all the people that are really big you know all the beautiful women that everyone idolizes are the ones that have like the like the absolute lightest skin while still sort of maintaining you know like there's still whatever there's they're st- you know and, and it's it's just so so he was just saying he was echoing what you're saying he was like 
How do you know what's best for other people? Did they ask for your help? Do they, do they want to change? Do they want your modern conveniences? Like who says this is the way mm-hmm. that everyone is supposed to live? Who says people are better off with your so-called fucking, you know, equality or, or social equity or, or whatever. It's just, it's like, you know, and I'm not saying we shouldn't protect the vulnerable elements in, in society. That's not it. But I think what, what all of this ends up being every time is just, you know, another kind of shape shift of, you know, the state being like, oh, hey, like, you know, look at all these disadvantaged people, you know, you should really like give me more power so I can expand the safety net even more like you should really give me you should really. So we can raise the debt ceiling another, you know, I don't know, 15 fucking trillion dollars or just some made up number. And then, you know, like, just you know, we, we'll, we'll give you an even greater safety net. All you have to do is buy into this crap, you know, and... And, and there's it's, one thing to keep in mind about safety nets. They only, is- they only work if you're in a circus. <laughs> safety nets are... Uh, they're only used in circuses, so just point that out. Otherwise, nets are to trap things, not to... And I guess maybe if you're washing windows on a skyscraper, you might have safety netting. But that is the right. If you're, yeah. But you're, really, it's the concept of a safety net comes from the circus, which I always think is interesting. And it's a net too. Nets not nets. Nets for trapping things. Nets are for trapping things. Yeah. Well. And now we're all using the net to communicate. What does that mean? Or the web. The web. Way, it's a right. trap. They're both used to trap things. Spiders, yeah, spiders don't make webs to keep flies safe. <laughs> <laughs> they really care about the welfare of those flies, actually. Yeah. Well, it's that's an excellent point to go back just a a, a, a tick um, as far as the you know progress of Western civilization, particularly in the last two hundred or so years. Um, you know, I've seen just in the last couple of days. Some interesting pictures, not that, you know, the, the whole concept is new to me. It's just these particular pictures are ones that I hadn't necessarily seen, but of late 1800s architecture, particularly European architecture uh-huh. versus pictures from today or, you know, in the modern you know, last 10 years or 20 years or whatever of those same areas. And one of the most kind of jarring ones to me is if you, I don't remember exactly what bridge it is, but uh, there's a photograph, uh, side-by-side photographs that I just saw, one taken from approximately the same area on a bridge over the Seine, looking, I think, with the Isle of Paris behind, looking out towards, anyway, the uh, the Empire State Building. (laughs) The Eiffel Tower is kind of in the background, and the picture's from a bridge, and you see the river right in front of you, and then um the the bank of the river uh and then you know the eiffel towers some ways in the background but in the modern picture that modern bank there uh, of the seine in paris is like a boulevard there's a path there's some trees you know fencing a lamp post maybe a bench here and there and that's it you know it looks more like a park than anything a little, you know, green belt or path or whatever you call it in your neighborhood, but a walking trail essentially next to the river. You look at that same, a picture from that same point of view from, I think, 1890, and there are buildings that are elaborately architecturally magnificent by comp- and, and they're just gone now. And we've made all this progress and the progress was destroying these amazing old buildings. So that's certainly a, a interesting uh, pictorial uh, expression of, of the advance of Western society, so, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's an interesting time, like, too, especially now, because, you know, we, we I, the phrase that I've come to use is, like, you know, capitalism is, like, uh 
we, we live in the time where capitalism is like the Ouroboros and it's just about to chomp down its own tail, sort of, so to speak. You know, globalism is kind of like, wait a minute, where do I go next? You know what I mean? Like, there's not a whole lot left to, uh, to, to exploit. Or there is, but it's like, it's getting dicey. And, uh, and it just seems like that's why I keep returning to the whole, you know, the, 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 the game is psychological because I think in order to sort of continue, um, and that's why it's so important that this like eco side extinction rebellion stuff catch on mm -hmm. is because ultimately what they want to do is just lower the standard of living in the West because there's, there's not actually enough poor people with access to the stuff that they, that they, cause they want poor people with access to technology, right? Yeah, essentially. That's, that, that's what, that's what makes this globalist wet dream work. Wow. I feel like this is officially not a podcast about art anymore. <laughs> just listening to what I'm saying. It's just not, uh, <laughs> If it ever was, um, they, uh, they, they need, you know, oh man, what have I become? We've got to start somewhere. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I had kind of a thought to maybe how some of this ties at least a little bit back into art because might as well give it a shot here. Um, but to tie back into, you know, the idea that this whole uh, uh, kind of direction, this trend that the, quote, art world has been going, uh, which has reached kind of a culmination of sorts in the glorification of the yes hip-hop gangster rap, really, more than hip-hop, gangster rap lifestyle. Um, and And how did it get to that point? You know, for me, it does trace back and go through kind of what Alan Watts would be talking about with the rise of Western civilization and how it's not really that civilized or civilizing and it doesn't really risen. It's more destroyed things, but um, exactly. it, it leads me to think of at least post mid 1800s. Yeah, I was going to, and that's where I was going because it leads me to kind of for, in my conceptualization of recent history, the last hundred and something years, as far as I understand it, and I could have bad information, I could be putting puzzle pieces together in the wrong order, whatever, but I kind of see 1895 particularly as a fairly watershed uh, a year for the direction that the 20th century was pushed. Uh -huh. um, and certainly testament to that are you know, for me, one of the big things that, that makes that a watershed year is that's when the uh, Cecil Rhodes and the Roundtable group really, you know, uh, uh, formed and started to to push forward different policies and ideas and things that would become uh, formational for mm -hmm. uh, particularly the world wars, but just the shape of the 20th century generally. Um, so 1895 is kind of a watershed year. And then if you track in through from there kind of in through the 20th century uh as far as how where does the artistic trend what is the artistic community doing what direction is quote-unquote art going um in the 20th century uh you really start to see what i consider to be that denigration of art starting as early as the very early 1900s um and then pushing itself to kind of the first you know if 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 the glorification of the gangster rap lifestyle is the kind of a current watershed or a kind of a current, you know, here's where we are now. You can also look back to me at a lot of what was going on in the 1930s, not just okay. in Nazi Germany, but elsewhere as well. But it's yeah, I know you're a, gonna bring up the 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 uh the the, the 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 guy the guy in Italy, brutalism or futurism. Futurism, yeah, yeah. And certainly yeah. futurism, yeah, absolutely. Uh can't remember his name off the top of my head the futurist manifesto guy but um yeah, yeah he that, said art is about violence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well and, and, and it's interesting too that that i think and especially now you know knock on wood cross my fingers whatever you know and my whole family is basically from ukraine mm -hmm. so that's my little um that's my disclaimer but it does seem like 
the, you know, we, Western society, or I guess at this point, global society, because we've kind of dragged everyone into our bullshit, lives in this kind of punctuated equilibrium, right? Where you have like this plentiful kind of Venusian renaissance harvest period, right? I was just talking to someone about that at um, like a prepper group meeting. Um, he was talking about how, you know, the reason the renaissance took place um is because there were many successive years of very bountiful, rich harvests. And there was a, a sort of a, it was like a, 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 a perfect, I don't want to say perfect storm, but, you know, just as an expression, it wasn't actually a storm. It was quite the opposite, right? It was more of like the calm after the storm. But yeah, it was a perfect storm of um, technological and social advances and also the timing of it. Um, and also the weather and the, you know, the climate and the natural environment were very cooperative to produce this flowering of human culture. Um, and it was also like, there wasn't really a lot of war going on during the Renaissance, right? And so, and what's interesting too, is we were, we were talking about like solar cycles and stuff. I know, I know that's, I wasn't there and I can't well, really say yeah, and It was a was different kind of Going war. on, but yeah, it was very different. What about right. it different? But uh, yeah, yeah, I was more like, you know, and then I, back in the day, you know, Italy wasn't even one country yet. It was just <laughs> nation states. But what I was going to say is that it's interesting because, and also the, the thing with solar cycles and, and, um, and growing conditions, growing conditions were extremely favorable back then. You know, that's why, you know, it's, I mean, Renaissance art is like, you know, naked people and grapes and like, you know, voluptuous, you know, supple <laughs> breasts and whatever. And so... What does that remind you of, at least in character? It reminds me of the 50s and the boomer generation because that, that was the time that solar activity on Earth peaked. So all of these, this, this global warming stuff and, all, and, and this whole sort of um, mentality of like you know endless production and like you know what i mean like 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 everything was too big to fail kind of at that point you know and also mm -hmm. i mean the u.s was in a really good position so i feel like they 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 had more of a solid foundation for some of these the dreams were not exactly pipe dreams yet because that we hadn't lost as much but but the thing that they both have in common is that there was a building up there was a building up of the human spirit right? At least, I guess it's arguable depending on how you view the Renaissance, but um, at least like in America, you know, during that generation, it was like, you know, very much like, and I've spoken to people who like worked and came of age during that time. And they were like, yeah, it was great. Everyone had jobs. Like all the, all the people who were consumers were the ones that were doing everything. But anyway, I digress. The point that I wanted to make is that I feel like these sort of if there's like a great conflict or a dark age, it tends to be follow it, followed by like a punctuated equilibrium of like this time of plenty, if you will, where art is allowed to more or less evolve naturally and organically versus, the, and, and the, the, so the global control mechanism kind of relaxes a little bit during those periods. Whereas now, and or going into World Wars One and Two it's more like the opposite. Like the financial system is getting a little dicey and they're like, okay, we need to crack the whip. And, and in doing that, they do several things simultaneously. That's the point I'm trying to get at. They do the, the, the wartime and the food shortages. And, but it's also very important, arguably the most important thing for, for this sort of cyclical thing that happens is to break the human spirit. And that's why like in, you know, there was a lot of like artists and artisans and stonemasons prior to World War I that were at an extremely high level of craftsmanship, like extremely high level of craftsmanship. If you look at pre-World War I, you know, like late 1800s architecture and, you know, handcraft, like these people were like, you know, to say nothing of the fact that there were many generations accumulated of wisdom and knowledge and craft and, you know, it was the family business, but they were at a really high level. And then war comes along and sort of, 
you have this beautiful and just exquisite craft and, and art, like physical art in many cases that took centuries to build and refine. And in an instant, it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's a Hiroshima away for lack of a better description. It's kind of vaporized. And then in the dust cloud afterwards, people are like, whoa, what happened? And then us looking back, we're like, well, we, we, we doubt the potential of the human being on a fundamental level. And that's, that's something we, we don't necessarily have to talk about today, but a lot of these theories coming out in alt media like Tartaria, I think are really interesting because while they fascinate me as well, it's like this theory is a symptom of how disconnected we are from our past where we're like, oh no, impossible. People couldn't have made that. Really? You know what I mean? Or they're, what they're, that's, what, that's what they're essentially saying. They're saying, oh, well, you know, modern people couldn't have made that. Europeans couldn't have made that. It was some forlorn, like long lost. It's like we are projecting this other into our past because we are so disconnected from this patient, um, like really highly developed craftsmanship and, and care oriented part of ourselves that spirit of our own people that we have to literally invent another culture and say, no, someone else must have made this. And it's similar to the UFO thing and the ancient aliens thing. If you think about it, it's like, no, 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 impossible. Because we, the archetype of our collective, you know, consciousness, the, the archetype of human society has been so degraded within our lifetimes that the dissonance is too great. And we literally have to invent, you know, the, the, the whatever, the blue avians, the Pleiadians, the Arcturians, the Tartarians. There's some mystical, you know, Ians that they, they made this beautiful stuff. They made these beautiful buildings that you see on the bank of the Seine in that old photo. Because when you compare it to what we're doing now, that can't even be the same humanity. And so that's, I just wanted to, to sort of squeeze that in there and say, I think they've done a really good job in degrading our image of ourselves. And that's the point I was getting at initially with all of these movie stars and musical artists is, you know, back in the day, they didn't have iPhones to constantly be taking selfies. And a lot of these like people who were working dawn to dusk they may not even have mirrors. The only time they would see themselves to be able to cast this I, quote unquote, or this ego is like the reflection that they had in some choppy river water. So you couldn't cultivate this idea of like, oh, you know, what is a man? What is a man in society? You know, what, what are you, what are you supposed to be like? What are you supposed to do? People just did what was necessary, you know? And, 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 but it, and I think it was obvious also like what was good and what was beautiful. And now I think it's been done very skillfully because now like lit people literally think that like, you know, this trap music and like Cardi B, like they think that that is the height of artistry. Mm -hmm. And I just, I really want to hammer this point home. What does that do to mass consciousness when you reach a critical mass of people that not only don't fight against like filth and depravity, just wholesale degenerate degeneracy, like invading this, this, the artistic and musical scene, but they actually encourage it. They sign on to it and they, they say, not just I'm okay with it, but yes, I agree. This is good. This is progress. We are progressing, you know, like Beyonce, Cardi B, et cetera, you know, Megan, the stallion, whatever, like they're so brave. Like when you get to that level, when you get to that point, you can pretty much take that collective mindset and do whatever the fuck you want to it. You know what I mean? Cause you, I mean, I, that, that's my, anyway, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but I, I just, I think it's, it's similar to when you, when you hypnotize someone in order to hypnotize someone, you have to first peel away their onion layers and, and literally like dissolve their sense of self. You have to sort of put their conscious mind to bed. And I think for us, that's kind of like a lot of what natural law talks about, objective morality. You know what right and wrong is. I know what right and wrong is. We all know what right and wrong is. But when we consume enough of this media, we start to become delusional about it.
because our mind is full of images of people doing unspeakably horrible things in a very casual manner. I mean, I mean, I don't know. What, what, do, you, what do you think? Am I, am I, am I off the mark? No, I, I, I agree. I, uh, I think the, the the important thing for me in that in terms of of that conversation would be to keep in mind the parallel uh, development, advancement, whatever you want to call it, trajectory, maybe a better term, the parallel trajectory of the education, the way that we impart knowledge to future to the next generation. Um, yeah, you had touched on the developmental mind, the the the, the, the child's developmental mind. You know, um, being like a sponge, and you know, you're absolutely right. Neurobiologists uh, certainly found that the first six or seven, well, from age what one and a half to two till age six or seven or eight, depending on kind of the individual child's development, the the, the child is just a sponge. And as, and and then once they get into that next stage, the late childhood, pre early adolescence, that's when they start to develop, you know, that sense of individuation and the sense of, or, and the the neurological ability to compare um, one idea to another and essentially start to develop the critical thinking, and that's why. That's why education, the education system starts around age five or six, just before they're transitioning into that uh, development of their own more the actual critical thinking faculties. Um, but the other thing about that, too, is inherently the child knows. All people know inherently the difference between right and wrong and as soon as they get to that point where they can start to compare ideas, if you want to confuse that sense of right and wrong, you know, you have to do that before the individual can develop that as it compares to other ideas. So the idea of right and wrong being hardwired is a fundamental reality. And by the time they get to the point in their development where they can compare one situation to another through the lens of fundamentally knowing what's right and wrong, you want if you want to control that person, you really want to start to undercut that sense of right and wrong and undercut their ability to compare one thing uh, to another. And that's essentially one, at, I won't say it's the reason why, but it's certainly one byproduct, if nothing else, of um, uh, the education system in terms of the years at which it's, it's brought it to bear. You know, it's not like we start publicly educating our kids at age 13 when they've already had several years to work on their comparative and higher level neurological, their um, executive function and stuff that starts to develop uh, a prepubescent and a prepubescent uh, uh, child mind. Um, but yeah, it's, it's to get in and start to subvert that as it's coming along. So it's developing in parallel. And then when you have that, you know, it's not just 15,000 hours of your childhood at school, but then you go home and turn on the TV and you get the same reinforcement from right. the, you know, art, <laughs> the musicians on the radio, the art quote, 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 unquote, on the TV, um, all reinforcing those same ideas. You know, it's absolutely bombarding uh, people from every level and in from every direction. And that, you know, again, comes out of this education system that was really brought to bear and really started to come into a finalized structure around uh, uh, the late 18, early 1900s. And then was developed on from there um, because that kind of, you know, then ties directly, the timing anyway, ties directly back to that timetable and at least my conceptualization of the last hundred and some years. And you're absolutely right in that you kind of have to set those operant conditions for people to be dumbed down or, or taken out of the imaginative, taken out of the comparative and executive level uh, uh, function. And Yes, then subvert their idea of what they were. And that's really where I was kind of going with the this kind of next point, which was, you know, the Nazi anti-decadent art movement, which kind of was born out of futurism, but really in the 1930s started to take off where, you know, Hitler, I think, had two art shows. I think one was in 34 or 5, and the other was in probably 37, late 37, which were like all the art that they had collected, which 
the Nazi Reich wanted to portray as essentially evil, something that the rank and file shouldn't be allowed access to. Um, and it was they this it anyway. quote, decadence <laughs> art. And really what that all that was. And, and it wasn't that it came out of the Nazis. The Nazis adopted this as a, it was coming out of the foundations and the foundations coming out of the round table. And we're talking Rockefeller, we're talking Hearst, we're talking Carnegie, we're talking Guggenheim, all these modern art, um, um, foundations and museums that are named after these folks do so because they set up these foundations and infiltrated universities not just to control medicine not just to control energy uh, paradigms and and this and that but also to control uh, uh how we conceptualize art and that's why this podcast exists because we've been told that art is one thing and it's absolutely not and the main source of what was telling us that were you know, these foundations that were grown out of this round table type uh, mentality. Um, and the, the art that was seen to be decadent was primarily the two major art movements, at least from, from a painting uh, standpoint, the, the standpoint of painting, painting um, the two main movements that were seen as decadent were uh, impressionism, which more or less is representational perspectivist, and uh naturalism and naturalism was extremely perspectivist and you know very much to do with scenes of nature with you know maybe a person or two in, in a frame and they'd be small but naturalism especially they is all about that as decadent well the nazis called it decadent that's what they labeled decadent art was impressionism and naturalism in favor of representative and particularly abject abstract expressionism and that is not perspectivist. That is, I mean, it's abstract. Mm -hmm. And so abstract expressionism then would go into the 50s. And, and this is where I kind of, I don't think the, the 50s were, were gossamer. They were not, I, 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 anyway, I don't, I don't want to speculate on people who lived and grew up in the 50s and what how accurate their interpretation of that uh, period was in terms of uh, broader context. But that aside, you know, that anti-decadence movement moved away from perspectivist art where the artist is saying, this is where I'm standing. This is the scene that I'm seeing. I'm painting it. And that was big in the naturalist movement. You know, it was, this is this great vista and there are hills as far as the eye can see and look how big and strong and great nature is. And if there's any people depicted, they're going to be small little specks on a hill way the heck out there just to give people the sense of how big nature is and how with all this technology that's come around about, you know, from the industrial revolution, we can't forget that we're still these tiny little cogs in this huge huge expanse of nature that we are part of that that we are a bit in that whole sea of of, of nature and that idea i mean just the idea that that would be labeled decadent is a perversion that's of the word decadent to begin with but that's what anti-decadence art was about and, and the funny thing is it's not that hitler and 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 goebbels and himmler and these folks that were going around right you know, after jews had been kicked out of their homes and taking the nice art right it Rules wasn't that they thought it was evil me. art it was right. they wanted people to think that it was evil art exactly so that then as the post-war period and even you know in the interwar era it started with the futurist movement which started i looked up uh tomaso marinetti uh started the right. futurist movement in 1909 and it really got traction after world war uh one in in italy with the fascist um uh social system that they were running there was big on on futurist art Mussolini like the futurist movement quite a bit um and you see a lot more of it uh in the 1910s and 20s but that was all the forerunner even even futurist art a lot of it was perspectivist you know it might be kind of abstract but it was not expressionist most of it was perspectivist you know you would be seeing this train moving through this you know really advanced looking city but it was still like you were standing there looking at something as opposed to a blur of color, which was supposed to express the notion of the idea of movement. And they're somehow kind of abstractly express the idea, well, this is a painting of a train, even though there's nothing that looks like a train. At most, you've got some lines that imply movement 
And so you're expressing the feeling of being on a train without showing yeah. being, you know, and, and so it's not perspectivist, it's, it's expressionist. And, and, and usually, you know, as it got on later, you get to, to folks like, um, and Jackson Pollock, which is expressionist abstract as all get out. And, you right. know, really his art to me had, there's no substance. There's no perspective being communicated. There's no worldview in that art, except fuck it, you know? And that was, that was, that was the, 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 the direction that art's been taken in the last hundred years. And I think the ultimate or the current uh, uh, kind of high watermark, if you could call it that is, is, this glorification of like you're saying high levels of immorality coming from all different sources of art you know media really advertising really um to you know because that's it it's no longer art it's now advertising this twisted lifestyle it's now advertising that you should be like bono or beyonce or Cher, not the real person but the persona that this that we all see, which is it's really like devilish, larger yeah, than life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't see, you know. I'll, I'll use Bono because who cares? Um, Bono is not Bono, right? Bono is a character that whatever his real name, whoever he is, is playing, and whoever he is, his job is entertainer. Exactly, and that's the role that he plays when he is at work yeah and, and if you those look people, at like they're almost always at work and we forget that these are entertainers playing characters we think that right. bono is the a real person right no that's the thing and it divorces to, us like you're saying from understanding ourselves and our past and having a connection to that and and undersells our ability to think about ourselves as you know i don't need a persona i don't need to create like you're i don't saying, need some, an identity some e i don't need tartarian yeah. whatever right. and um, I don't need some other thing to come and do this for me. So, right. And, and I think, well, yeah, you, you made a lot of really good points. Um, I want to say that, yeah, it's, it's important to remember, you know, to the extent that you don't want to be influenced subconsciously by these people that, that, you know, anyone on the world stage is a paid actor if they're a musician, they're a paid actor playing the role of a musician. You know what I mean? They may still be able to make music. You know, they may still have musical training. If they're, you know, uh, you know, the 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 head of the NIH. You know what I mean? Then they are a paid actor. You know what I mean? It's and it's so it's so in that sense, directing any real genuine emotion at them is somewhat comical because it's like getting angry at the Muppets. It's like, dude that's a fucking sock puppet. Like there's a, there's a greater hand at work literally and figuratively. Um, yeah. You made a lot of really, really good points. I think the, the, the point that you make about expressionism, it just takes me into wondering um, back, back to, you know, the Greeks and stuff, you know, and like, or it's, it's, because when you have these myths, right, of the heroes, like that, that, that mythology, that is intertwined with nature. I think that's the key difference in all of this. Yep, you have nature 100%. and you have natural law. That's why all of those stories, all of, and if you look at Native American mythology, nature is always the prime mover. Nature, the great spirit, the gods on Mount Olympus, whatever it is, it's always like natural forces are, are, front and center you know like demeter goes underground you know to hades or whatever to or persephone i should say you know and and the the, the that's why you know the, the everything dies in in the fall and it's like this cyclical nature of things is woven like a tapestry through all of these the old stories i dare say the real stories whereas the new stories are like this Luciferian, truncated, amputated Frankenstein that is ambulating along and has no connection to nature whatsoever. And I, the reason that I, that, that I ended up kind of thinking about that is I was thinking, you know, yeah, the thing about abstract expressionism is it is, it is the 
the quant the full quantization or atomization of the human capacity for abstraction it is literally ripping it out like like surgically ripping out just our capacity to create images in our mind and completely disconnecting them from any meaningful context and it that's just really interesting to me because i think that 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 very much falls in line with what appears to be the the goal for a lot of this stuff which is just making people just delusional out of touch with reality just flat out you know and having a vr helmet on whatever the other thing that that you as you were talking this this is what i wrote down these notes okay because we were talking about children um and in order to what what like so I believe, not, not believe, I think it's, it's proven that children are programmed to mimic. They're programmed to look up and, and, and emulate. They're programmed to look up at adults and um, functional, shall we say, full-fledged members of the tribe and, and say, wow, look at father, you know, he's, you know, he's so big and strong with his bow and he goes out and he helps the other men hunt the antelope and whatever it might be. Or, you know, father is, you know, building ships for the, for the, the Queen's Navy, whatever the fuck it is, right? Right? And there is a, there's a voltage drop, if you will. There's a, there's a power differential. You know, you're like this small, relatively ineffectual child. You don't have any special skills. You haven't been assigned a role in society. You don't know how things are done. You don't know what you're going to do. People don't really take you seriously. You know what I mean? It's, it's, and so you're, you're down here and your, um, your role model, if you will, is up here. Okay. And so, and I think that is integral to this sort of trance-like state of learning and, and absorbing and, and, and mimicking, right? Mimicking, that's the key. So what I was thinking is how do you recreate that in an adult? Or how do you extend that process so that the person never actually grows up and is constantly in this childlike state of, wow, look at so-and-so. You know, they're, 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 they, so, and so what I wrote down is culture of the, of the global man child. Um, children dream of becoming grown ups, right? When a person becomes an adult, and that's why you have all these coming in, in a tribal society, in a traditional mm -hmm. society, you would have a coming of age ritual, right? We don't have that in our society. We do not have that in our society. Anybody who disagrees, we should have them call in. I will, I will debate that point with you. I will be happy to debate that point with you until I need to be involved. I, I would say crowd. some some smaller pockets of culture have something akin to that. They do. I think the the more I mean, you would agree, some sure. the, more, the more homogenized and yeah. the more standardized the culture becomes Western less society, of that. No it's way. honestly it's interesting too yeah it's like the same way that we destroy our food we destroy the identity of our food by processing out everything meaningful namely the minerals the literal physical anchor and the, the good stuff that's supposed to be in there we don't actually need that many calories incidentally this is something i'm learning calories are kind of a psyop what we need are minerals minerals are literally the we, I don't even, I, I mean, there's a lot I could say, but they, there's something very special and magical about them. They literally are required to like anchor down this electric God source field. And so, and, and it's now there's no, there are no minerals left in food at all. And any minerals that there are in something like wheat are all processed and bleached away. And they, you know, what do they, what do they put in instead? enriched flour yeah, you know synthesized iron synthesized so, versions of and that's what's in your centrum silver as well is just mm -hmm. iron filings and 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 calcium fucking metal shavings you know yeah. that's what that's Byproducts what so, from 
manufacture of other chemicals. Exactly. And so and so it's the same thing with art and with myth as well is everything is processed and homogenized like new age. I always come back to new age is the perfect example. New age is the soylent green of mythology and of spirituality because it's this reconstituted, you know, vaguely, you know, plant or fungus or you know, dick cheese based fucking like, you know, patty that's like unclear who came up with it or what, what, you know, Bill Gates, 1984 nightmare it's from. But the point is, you'll never find out because it was made in a lab. It was, you know, cultured in a vat. They're all the same. You know, it's, it's got your things they tell you, you need, you know, it's got your protein and your carbs and your, you know, whatever. Uh, and, um, but the thing it doesn't have is any connection to the real world. You, you can, you'll you never know if there's grass in it. You'll never see the grass. You don't know which blade of grass. There's no, it does not have any soul. And that's the food in this case. And that is how these cultural rituals are now. The ones that are passed down of like, hey, it's like, you know, it's like Sunday night football. And from my vantage point, I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? about why do you do that how many generations has this been going on what's the point why do we do this you know well, what why is your team named this what is the history of that is there like a you know what i mean like what is the significance why do you do this because it makes you feel good or you think it makes you feel good does it really make you feel good do you feel connected to something greater than yourself and like why? Like, why does this resonate with you? And I think when you ask that question, ultimately, most most people just fall back on like, well, it's what people do. It's and what, what else is there? Right. Like, what I know I need there? that connection to the natural world. But I don't that doesn't that connection is not available. So I have to take a proxy connection to. So it's like culturally or, or mythologically, we live in a food desert. Right. Because it's like you need minerals. You need to be doing celery juice. And people are like, what are you talking about? What is celery? What is juice? I've never seen a green thing in my life. Everything is white or potato chip colored and comes in a bag. That's and so that's where we are. And so anyway, so to get back to what I have here in, in the notebook, I think this is really interesting. Right. So you're creating this situation. Right. You're creating this culture of like disenfranchised completely just beaten down, demoralized soy boys, right? Subsisting on Marvel movies and anime, okay? Hey, I like anime. I like anime too. Just kidding. Go I on. take shots at myself. Um, well, like, you know, I, I don't like to admit <laughs> there's certain ones. Some of them are beautifully drawn. But anyway, but, but you get what I'm saying, right? You, 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 you totally get what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, no, like I said, the art is, is beautiful, anyway. but, but I don't think, I, I don't think either of us can deny that yeah, like anime. I'm not, I'm not like standing here full throating defending anime. Well, I was I just making mostly a joke. I was going to say it's, it's, it's morphed into something uh, beyond like it's, I feel like it's even the yeah, guy, yeah. The, the guy that created anime, I think recently I was told by my friend, Mel, he was like, I, made a mistake he was like i did not know it would be used for this purpose mainly because of the trans thing and like hentai like it's it's it, sure, it's sure. gone in a direction sure. like that's you know it's now it's been weaponized but anyway yeah. basically so you have these people who are i won't single out marvel or anything else who are subsisting on this artistic or media equivalent of of soil and green right well mm -hmm. i don't have my own ritual you know we're not the, the, the in in uh in lieu of, in the vacuum of, you know, the tribe all got together and we went up on the cliffside at sunset and we all shot our bows and, you know, tried to take down a gazelle. That doesn't happen anymore. Nothing like that happens anymore. You know, there's no the hunt. There's not even really the harvest. We have no connection to what makes life work at all. Our food literally shows up. We literally go into a supermarket lined with corpses of flesh beings and fibrous vegetal beings with some liquids and we just pick things and it's like someone somewhere i don't know you know what i mean like if you if you ask kids these days where does food come from they say walmart and dollar tree 
And we hope you've enjoyed the first half of this discussion. We'll see you when we pick it up in the next one. Take care.